the boondog, uh, boondogs while they uh, were the sophisticated southerners. And that gave them a big advantage because they could kind of surprise them. So why didn't he spread like north at all? Why was it all south and, and west? Or because that's where the money was. Um, where were the great empires? Where was the great empire? Persia. Where was the okay. gold? Persia. And Egypt was part of the Persian Empire without, you know, a lot of Greeks had gone there. That's where they copied a lot of their architecture. And it was just unlimited wealth. That's what he wanted. So let's talk a little bit more about Greece. Let's go take your notes out. And it's such a good story. Whipping the water in Xerxes. Actually, Xerxes was an interesting guy. You know, he was at what they called Oriental for a king. He wanted people to genuflect and bow to him. The what? Genuflect, bow. Oh. Bow, not look him in the eye. You know, that gave him that sense of power. And at the same time, the story is when he looked at he looked at those men crossing that bridge here. He started to weep because he came with this idea that in 100 years, they'll all be gone. And that really bothered him. Of course, that's also incredibly arrogant because he's a god. <laughs> I'll still be here. <laughs> I'll still be the god. By the way, why are they put up barriers on the side? A little bit. A little bit, and it would shift. But even more just um, basic thinking about what's going to be traveling over. A mile long, this pontoon bridge. Yeah, the, the horses wouldn't panic. So they put this up on the side so the horses wouldn't see the water. Which, clever, makes sense. And this army, huge army. Oh, what were the city-states of western, what is now Turkey, Anatolia? That rebel. What were they called? Do you remember that? Mycenae was the name of that uh, the pre um, Golden Age. Ionians. Yeah, the Ionians. The Ionian city states. They rebelled. I think I told you about Cronus. Didn't I tell that in class? Did you, did you remember that story, where he resisted um, the Persians and how they were going to punish him? They built a funeral pyro. Pyro. Oh yeah. And what were they, instead of wood, what did they stack him on top of? His children. Yeah, his sons. The funeral pyro of his son. They turned out, he, they put, he, um, Darius let Cronus survive. So we got Marathon, and the Persians were defeated. Xerxes wants to come back. And do we get to Thermopylae then? We're coming to the Battle of Thermopylae. This was like Persia and Greece. Mm -hmm. Still part of the same battle. I'll come back to that in a sec. So there's this narrow strait. Now it's a highway. And it used to have come, the hills came down, and the water used to be right here. But now it's spread out, and there's a main four lane highway right here. And so imagine this being a significantly narrower pass. And it's going to be called the Battle of Thermopylae. And let me go to a map and show you where it's at. Right here. In fact, the plan was a few Spartans, the Greek plan, a, a small delaying force here at this pass. The main Athenian fleet would be here. Athens had the huge fleet. They would try to destroy the Persian fleet. And then they were making a main defense line. See this little narrow peninsula right here? Before they get to Peloponnese. And I should add one thing. 
back in 481, or um, my years are wrong, 491, the Persian fleet that was following along with Darius that sailed here, they went to Marathon. They lost. As they were sailing back, they were destroyed in the very rough seas right here. I guess this is a spot where you get the cross currents like here, and the seas are really rough. They actually made a massive canal here so they could avoid the rough seas. They spent six months. Well, I about said Xerxes spent six months. Trust me, he had nothing to do with it. They dug a canal. And actually, it took so long because they were digging a canal. And I think you can imagine what happens when you dig a canal in relatively uh, wet area with a pretty high water, water table. You shovel up, and what happens? It sticks. Or in the water, it just comes right down. <laughs> yeah, it sticks to the shovel, makes it miserable. Eventually, they made it 98 feet wide. They started and then went down to 66 to make this canal work. So that was a Persian engineer. Six feet deep? Yeah, well, it's only 13 feet deep, 66 feet wide, I'm sorry. So they could get their flat bottom ships through. Uh, they do have engineering in Empire of Persia, but we're not watching that one. So let's get back to this then. So the Battle of Thermopylae. There's auxiliaries, servants, um, hoplites from other Greek towns, uh, Thebians, Corinthians. Um, but the bulk of the force were 300 Spartans. And everybody just remembers the 300 Spartans, and I'll tell you why in just a second, but 300 Spartans. And they went with their king, King Leonidas, and their plan, a delaying force, just to delay the Persians. This is a very stylized picture. Uh, there's a wall set up here, and the Persians had a very narrow path to get through. So even though the Persians had 200,000 people, they couldn't put them all there at that one spot. So they had to go through a very narrow pass. And in fact, when the first Persian guards arrived there and saw a few Spartans behind this wall, the Spartans were there doing their hair, just fixing their hair. And they thought, they're not warriors. They care about their hair. Well, a Spartan exile who ran away to the Persian Empire, was kicked out of Sparta, told Xerxes, they're doing their hair because that's how they prepare to fight to the death. That's what their warriors do. And Xerxes, you know, kind of didn't believe him. Eventually, yeah, he would change his mind about the Spartans. And mm -hmm. so it was narrow. So like they, they could only fit like four men or very few men up forward. Yeah. And so that's where the Spartans, I imagine, superior exactly. fighting skills would be. So they put the Spartans right in the middle, hold that center of the line. Anything along the flank trying to get around and through the water, they put the auxiliaries. Mm -hmm. The Spartans would line up in their hoplites and their phalanx right there, yeah. So they couldn't get enough men lined up to go through them. And the fighting, I guess, was unreal. Because Xerxes just, he was in a hurry. So there weren't a lot of tactics. He lined his men up and tried to go bowl through. And they would be slaughtered. This is a... Uh, Okay, this one looked better when I put it up here than when I stretched it out. It's not quite as good. But they had auxiliaries in the behind firing bows and men on top rolling boulders from the, hip, the cliffs above. I guess it was a lot steeper than what it is today. But Xerxes was very much stuck. And then, so here's a, <laughs> I just thought this was kind of funny. Here, it does give an idea of the mob trying to get through. And even though they greatly outnumbered them, dots represent <laughs> approximately a thousand men, but they couldn't get through. But what happened was this, and this shows it a little bit better. They found a goat trail, and a Greek who lived there for a little bit of money led them over a goat trail that went over the mountains, and they could get behind. And so um, that's his... Alcibiades would become known, uh, synonymous with treason. In the United States, you've heard of Benedict Arnold. Same kind of thing. In Norway, it's Quisling, you know, the, 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 the traitor. And so they're able to get all the way behind and cut them off. When King Leonidas, and I'll show you Leonidas in a second, remember Sparta had two kings. So one of their kings went with the army, the other one stayed back in Sparta. 
he allowed, ordered most of the other Greeks who had survived to leave. So they survived. And he and about 800 of the people who carried all the armor for the Spartans, you know, remember the helots, the slaves? They stayed. Nobody remembers the helots. Everybody just remembers that final 300 Spartans. Because they knew they were surrounded, but Leonidas' plan to hold off to the end. And here's Leonidas after the Greek had, had been, Greeks have been sent back, and this idea of getting them ready to fight to the death. And here's the supposed last battle. And you know, they were just outnumbered from both sides and just crushed. And the big thing is once they were they can isolate them into a small group. I think you can imagine what's going to happen. Spartans don't surrender, at least to the Peloponnesian War. So there's this movie called Okay, we're not gonna watch it. I'll show the movie when we there's a movie three and Spartans. I've shown it in the past, but it just doesn't work for the way we're doing classes now. I was going to show you the final battle scene, but I know we're going to get copyright gain, and then we we'll, might lose the whole video. So I'll tell you what we're going to do. I'm going to go finish this part, and maybe the last 10 minutes class, I'll show you that part, and I'll just shut off the YouTube. Sound good? Watch the last battle scene. It's from 1962. It's a pretty good movie. I know they made one about this that has nothing to do with reality called The 300. I think it was called The 300. I didn't see it. It's like 10 years ago. None of you? I think it's one of those, a lot of you know, special effects. But the big thing is they were able to use bows. Once it got in close, the arrows, they could not withstand the bows. Killed them all. And at this spot, there is a statue of Leonidas, the king. And this plaque. And so this became a saying for those who are trying to make their last defense. Go tell the Spartans. Basically it's saying, it's a little bit complex, the, the translation, but it's saying, go tell the other Spartans. Go tell our, go tell our successors what we did. And this is what Spartans did. Now, Spartans were horrible slave owners, and <laughs> that's not going to glorify them too much, but they did fight to the death there and did give time. This is the big statue of Leonidas for the king. And it's right on the highway. He made it. Huh? Yeah, well, let's not go there. Everybody's naked in these pictures. One thing I'm going to show you then, let me go back to the map. So, the Athenian fleet was right here. The Athenian, the Athenian fleet had these big triggers. We saw that in the video. Those big, and we're not even sure how they exactly sat the sea. To this day, we're not sure how they fitted three decks of rollers. They have an idea, but they still don't know for sure. And they did this, they were still using triggers all the way up to the 17th century, basically following the Greek design. Yeah, they might be sticking a cannon on by then, but it's pretty amazing how long they use those. The Athenian ones were big, huge, monstrous ships with a big, um, a big ram in front. The Persian ships were mostly Egyptian or Phoenician, had one row of oarsmen, and were much faster. And they were caught, the Athenians, out in the open here, and those smaller ships just ran circles around them. And the Athenian fleet was beaten. Not destroyed, but beaten. They limped back to Salamis here. But then, where are we at here? Thermopylae held them off just long enough for them to escape. So, the Persians broke through, and the mob advanced towards Athens. Yeah? But is, it, is this series of battles where the Battle of Salamis is? Mm -hmm. It's coming. Okay. Right after this. I should add, the army was so big, there were stories. Like, for example, near where uh, Troy was. Remember the Trojan Wars? There are stories of the Persian army arriving and with all their animals and men and start drinking out of a river and drying the, drying the river up. By drinking so much, it was nothing but mud. Which I can't even hardly wrap my mind around. 
just all just drink, you know, just sucking all the water out. That seems a little bit far-fetched, but I guess when you have 300,000 men in a relatively small river in a dry area, yeah. But do you see the problem? Where are they going to get supplies? You know, their army is too big. So let's go back. Do, 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 do. I should have put a map there, but I didn't. So Persia advanced to Athens, and Athens evacuated. Everybody pulled out of Athens. They all went to the island of Salamis, and that's probably the reason why the fleet was there. Except for a few people hanging out in uh, the Acropolis. This is some of the archaeological digs near the Parthenon. And a lot of this shows signs of the, of the destruction by the Persians. And this is a very stylized picture of the destruction of the Acropolis. I put it up there. I, you know, I'm trying to find a picture. You know, they're all paintings. And yes, they slaughtered everybody who remained to hold out in the Acropolis. And so Athens was taken and destroyed and ruined. I mean, they raised it. Remember, Darius was told and passed it on to his son. Remember the Athenians. Remember the Athenians. And so... And that was from Mer... No. Why, the, why were they mad at the Athenians? That came from the, the Athenians helping with the Ionian Revolution. Okay. And basically, it's like Athens can get away with whatever they want. We'll show them. Actually, a lot of city-states, they gave in. And they gave the symbolic gift of earth and water, so dirt and water to, to Xerxes, basically saying, we'll submit. And it's one of those what-ifs. What if they submitted here? Our course of history would, would be significantly different. So much of the way we think is going to come out of Greek thinking. And we'll get to that. A little bit about Socrates, Aristotle, Euclid, if you like geometry. So the Battle of Salamis. And as we saw in the video, they did a good job explaining that. So we know what happened there. There was a trick. Uh, Thermistocles, who is the leading citizen of Athens, tricked Xerxes had him go into a narrow body of water. And so what happened was, this is the actual, <laughs> uh, this picture I took from my, by my private jet, no, the, uh, but they got Xerxes to spread out to try to cross to cut off the Greek fleet. And that allowed Themistocles to get his fleet ready to attack. Smaller, but his big ships not only had the advantage in a set piece battle, but as Xerxes' fleet moves this way, Xerxes was on a mountaintop right here. He was watching this go on. And quite shocked. The whole fleet's not there. And everybody knows that if you screw up in battle, what will happen to you in Xerxes' empire? Head on a pike. The two lead engineers that um, were responsible for that first attempt at the pontoon bridge, both of them were very publicly beheaded. And not the nice little, no, hacked. They hacked it off with a relatively dull sword. How does it have to be that you're the next engineer? <laughs> you're you too, build! It's like the, the Death Star engineer. <laughs> and so, by the way, they'll get this in the, in the movie uh, The 300 Spartans. Xerxes is like the Soviet Union. In the 300, he's like the terrorist. So, where are the Persians defeated by the Italian, or the Italian? The Italian Navy won, but they were able to defeat them because they attacked one small section, and this shows the larger Greek fleet crushing the smaller, the smaller Persian ships that were stuck in this isolated strait and they couldn't maneuver. And what kept happening was they saw the battle going on, and every admiral was thinking, or every captain of every ship in the Persian Navy is thinking, I better get into the battle, or Xerxes is going to blame me and cut my head off. And so they all come storming in, and they got caught up in each other, and the Greeks literally went from ship to ship and sunk almost all of them. These smaller ships could not handle the ram that led this way. And here's a more stylized painting from the 19th century. Themistocles would be a great hero. He was kind of a scoundrel. You know, he sent a letter to, to Xerxes saying, 
Now this is how you capture us. My Greek allies are leaving, so this is how you capture us. He didn't tell his Greek allies that he sent the letter, so forced them to stay in the battle. And then after the battle, he sent a letter to Xerxes saying, I'll let your fleet escape. Don't come back. Mocking him. And oh, so... Wait, the Themistocles sent that to yeah, Xerxes? Yeah. And he totally tricked Xerxes. He sent this message, literally sent the message to you. I'm mad at my Greek allies. This is how you destroy them. Athens is gone anyways. And so with that... I just noticed the map looks really good online, but do you notice how they make this blue and the water blue? So I was looking on the smaller computer screen and it looked like this. I thought, wait a minute, did this all flood? This is, do you see it now? Yeah. Yeah, this map looked a lot better when I looked on the computer screen. I thought, that's a good map. And so they're holding out right here. There's Salamis. And that, afford, that made Xerxes retreat back and he sent that. Uh, half his army back. They couldn't feed them all. They left 100,000 men. So Xerxes is thinking, okay, I lost my fleet, but I'll get them next year. I just tried Athens. But this narrow peninsula, they couldn't get through. And with the walled city of Corinth block blocking part of it, it was almost impossible for him to get through. Yeah. Isn't it, aren't they like really, really far from home? Yeah, well, yeah some of them are all the way from India. Yeah, so soldiers like from the all the there. Oh, so the Persian Empire was Oh, okay. Yeah, the Persian okay. Empire, they conquered Thrace a decade before. Okay. But the Persian Empire goes all the way yeah. <laughs> to India. And Sardis is the kind of the, the western capital. Pelopoli is right here, which is now in Iran, and that was their main capital. So yeah, they're a long ways away. But they remember they had those roads, those royal roads. Persia was a pretty advanced kingdom. So let's get to the rest of this. It's such a good story. But when the Persian army was trying to fight through here, they got caught in the mountain pass by the, um, by the Greek city-states that stayed in the battle, mostly here, led by Spartans, and the remnants of the Athenian army, which, remember, they were able to flee and still fight. And at the Battle of Plataea, 35,000 under Spartan command. That's what I meant. 35,000 Greeks defeated an army of 100,000. But that's, they got trapped. Xerxes had went home. Xerxes was not there. But it was the very brave Persian army, but they didn't have that heavy phalanx. And the phalanx just crushed them. And with this, Persia would stay in conflict with the Greeks. There'd be conflicts off and off in the next 200 years until Alexander conquered them, or 100 years. But th this would be the last major Persian invasion. Persia would become involved in the Peloponnesian War. And so Athens is completely destroyed. Persia couldn't stay out, huh? No, they couldn't. This was humiliated, even though Xerxes, to be honest, never really wanted to do it, but he felt he had to because of his dad. But yeah, Persia, there's a, this rivalry will go on. And you see elements of the same kind of thinking when we get like the Byzantine Empire and the Ottoman Empire. And then today, Turkey and Greece still don't like each other. They almost, they're almost at war right now over a couple islands over natural gas, right now. And 1974, they fought over Cyprus. They, they both occupied Cyprus for 20 years. And ironically, they're both members of NATO, the North American Treaty Organization, that is the US alliance that was made to stop the Soviet Union. And they're both members, and they fought each other. So, the aftermath of this Persian War. This would be pretty big. The Delhi League was created just as a, and then, I didn't put this behind, let me finish this. Desolate plans of mice and men. So was Plataea the last major battle? Yeah. There will be a couple more battles, but that was basically it. So a new league of city-states was created called the Delian League. But this was mostly cities in the north. 
and Ionia. Ionia now survived as relatively, relatively independent because of the, Ar the Athenian fleet. The Athenian fleet would come to dominate. Everybody just accepted the Athenian fleet. In fact, the story was Athens and Themiscles. Themiscles, they made their, or they made Athens great and protected not by a wall of stone, but a wall of wood. The wooden sides of their triremes. So these were the city states that allied themselves against Persia. At the at city state of Delos, there would be a treasury. And what happened was all okay, I put much. It's supposed to be must. All must pay for defense. So either they must contribute ships to fight the Persians, or join one of them that is. Huh? Forcibly join one of the city states that is. Yeah. Or but also I'm still must. <laughs> they give money. And then the money will go to the treasury in the city state of Delos. And the whole thought was, okay, if we don't want to build a fleet or don't have that ability, at least we'll pay for it. But what's going to happen is the most dominant state in the Delian League will be Athens. And in many ways, this will become like an Athenian empire. In fact, Athens would dip into that treasury to rebuild Athens. By the way, what's the first thing that Athens rebuilt? Parthenon was not quite there yet. But that's a really good guess, but no. The walls. They built their walls as quickly as possible. What country was mad, or what city state was really mad at them for building the walls? Sparta. Sparta didn't have walls. To their point of view, we don't need walls, we have our soldiers. You have your fleet. It's a balance of power. Because Sparta and them were kind of rivals. They knew they might blow up, but the Athenian walls, and I guess they took all the old ruined monuments, everything, and stacked them up in the walls. So I guess the walls were really kind of cool. Too bad only just bits of it survived. You can't really see the remnants of the old buildings. Yeah? How were they sinking the ships? They're ram. Oh, the ram would just bust right Yeah, there. so if you look at the bow of the ship, right here, underneath the water, is a ram. It oh, sticks out. Okay, like that. And so they would ram. Down. So the rowers would go full speed and try to catch those ships. Now, the first time they met, these smaller ships could avoid it, but they were all trapped because of it. Yeah, well, the I, was, I was just thinking, I was like, they didn't have cannons. How? <laughs> it so was the, like the railroad or the like steam engine sort of cattle guard thing, basically. On, yeah. Oh, yeah, for yeah. a cattle guard for a. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Like how you put like a push bar on a car. That's exactly kind of what happened. They would also have soldiers right here to to and war. Just mount it and just slaughter. Yeah, and these were and they come up. I'll show you the Roman one. The Roman ones have this big hook. It's pretty funny what the Romans decided. And there'd be rams like in the Civil War. They both uh, the United States Navy made rams but using the steam engine. They bang plow into them. They still plan on using those into the 20th century until they realize your know, modern guns just blow those out of the water. Oh, um, let me get to this real quick and then we'll. Technically, it was supposed to be a 30 years peace. But what country, what city state would blow this up? Sparta. Athens. Athens. Athens got too big. And Sparta, you know, Sparta's looking at this to their point of view. To their point of view, Athens is becoming too powerful. So why didn't they just build walls and become powerful? They had the powerful army. So they thought, we don't need walls. We got our soldiers. But as they saw, they knew Sparta alone is not strong enough. If Athens becomes so powerful and forces other city states to join the Delian League to overwhelm Sparta. So why didn't they attack them? We're coming to that. Okay. <laughs> I'm guessing they did. That's yep. what I'm There's Pericles, and he came to represent the democracy. And look how they put the helmet on his head. Yeah, he had a pointy head. I always wonder how pointy it is. Because it was just pointy, but was it just like a little mound? Or was it like a point? So yeah. I'm kind of curious. Why didn't they just make the statues that are not pointy? 
you know, they, they really got into realism and wanted this closer representation. So I'm sure they made him look probably more, you know, to their point of view, more leaderly and handsome. But and he would in many ways be the dominant figure in the Afghani democracy for, I mean, look at that, that's 32 years. And he believed in the, he was personified that citizens should rule, but he, through his great oracle skills, would influence civilians. And he pushed for expansion. He wanted city-states to come under their power. If anybody didn't pay their dues to the Delian League, what happened? Pericles attacked them. Well, he didn't, but he had Athens attack. Athens soldiers have been fighting pretty much constantly. Those little islands of the fleet would show up and extort money. So on that note, I'm shutting off online, but I will put this